Hello there. Welcome to this week's episode of the Data Radio Show, where I get to sit down and chat to a Texan who has the most Irish sounding name in the world in a fashion sense straight out of Hawaii. He is absolutely fascinating. And even his title sort of ties back into just how much experience he's got in the field. I'm talking to Patrick O'Halloran. He's the solutions architect for Wearscape based out of Texas. And one of the reasons he has that particular title is because he knows a little bit about everything to do with everything when it comes to the organization and other organizations that they've worked with. He's a wealth of knowledge and expertise, and he has seen some massive changes happen within our industry over the last number of years. So it was really cool to sit down and have a chat to him and learn about, well, exactly the path that he's been on, but also to learn some other interesting tidbits as well, like how AI automation is helping sell hot dogs at baseball games. Look, it's probably better just to sit down and have a listen to the episode, um, but do enjoy, take notes. It's really, really fascinating stuff. Um, Patrick O'Halloran, Solutions Architect from Wearscape. First of all, how are you? How are things going for you? Doing well, doing well. I live in Dallas, Texas, and we're actually having probably the mildest summer I've ever seen here. The rest of the country is complaining about say, heat. isn't Dallas supposed to be yeah. going through a heat wave? Dallas isn't, surprisingly, but you are in New Zealand, so you must be in the throes of winter. We are. It has been nonstop rain for the last week, and we've managed to get to highs of uh, in uh, centigrade about 13, 14 degrees. Okay. Um, so, and I'm in the warmer part of the country. That the southern tip of the country has been covered in snow for the last three days. So it's yeah. I'm not cold. quite bilingual with with uh, with temperatures, so I have to quickly do some mental math and do the times nine over five at 32. Uh, yeah, I have to. Admit, I've never learned Fahrenheit. It, it's not something that we do here. It's the same as um, feet and inches. We don't do that here either. Yeah, yeah. Which, is, which throws people a little bit. But um, there are some things that still get measured in inches, but they tend to be more for apps that might crash during the Republican National Convention. Those kind of apps are the, the sort that still use inches as measurements. It's very strange. It's very weird. Um, tell me about a typical day for you. What is a typical day for a solutions architect? So... Typically, solutions architects are part of the sales team. Mm -hmm. um, I began my background as being primarily tactical. Um, I'm one of those guys that started programming when I was 13 and took math classes for fun. Uh, if I had electives to take in college, I would sign up for more math classes. So somehow I wound up in uh, marketing for a while, and now I'm in sales, which is kind of a change for me. So the sales team typically consists of an account executive who is going to um, know the sales process. They're gonna work out the contacts. They're gonna understand how to write purchase orders, how to get projects pushed through, overcome obstacles and things like that. And then I and my compatriots, we are the technical, technical experts on uh, our product. So days consist of doing things like product demonstrations. Um, I may talk to a, a new prospect find out what their pain points are. Uh, some are unique, uh, but there's a lot of common ones I can talk about a little later that everyone seems to be running into. Uh, in addition to that, we'll do proof of concept, which is a more involved, say, two and a half day effort. I go to trade shows. I do quite a few speaking engagements, probably a half dozen a year. And uh, I do interviews like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's, out. <laughs> I probably spend a couple hours a day just learning. Um, I'm one of those people that always liked learning things and I've gotten bored with jobs where I stopped learning. There's just so much technology today um, in terms of data engineering, data warehousing. If you want to talk about data lakes, data lake houses, data vaults, data data yurts is, is the term I came up with to uh, make, up, make up something new. Whether it's data bricks or snowflake or uh, learning today, I'm learning about iceberg tables now. Uh, there's just iceberg tables. So, yeah, so there's just a lot of technology, and I would say probably a quarter of my time is running to something I can't answer, mm -hmm. and then having to do research to find an answer for it. One I'll, of our I'll, past guests, I was, was going to say, one of our past guests, they, they also said something very similar about learning. Like, like ten percent of their time of their day is just learning new stuff because there's so much stuff coming through. No, no one can know it all. Uh, I rely a lot on the other essays. We all kind of have areas of expertise. Um, um, well, quite a while ago, my say... brother, quite a while ago, my brother asked me because I was working in Unix. How do you? Get... I'm old enough that I say Unix, not Linux, but I was working in Linux, um, 
And uh, he asked me, how do you get to be an expert in that? And I said, well, it's like a lot of things. You don't need to know all the answers. You just need to know where to find all the answers. That's a really good way to look at it. Yeah. And when people tell me Unix, I just think Jurassic Park. For some reason, that <laughs> popped up in my head. With the, with, with, the, with the GUI interface. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, so what sort of activities are you seeing people undertake these days when it comes to, to engineering? So I probably talk with four or five, six prospects um, a week, if not more. Um, a lot of my job is to ferret out what are they doing? What are they trying to do? Where are they at? What are their pain points? Because typically at Warescape, we, we, we offer software that is, a, a, we call it data warehousing automation, being able to build mm -hmm. data warehouses through automation. And I can get into that a little later because that's a more encompassing term than people think. It's not just code generation. It's a lot more than that. Uh, but what are people trying to do? I mentioned before that there's some common problems that everyone seems to run into. Uh, a lot of it is failed projects they've tried before, and this is their second, third time to try and build out a data warehouse. There's a good quote by Gartner that came out in a report, I think in 2022, uh, the business consulting team that said that of all IT projects, data warehouses are probably the, the riskiest and costliest projects to build um, because it takes a long time to build it. and it's getting better, but I think one of the biggest problems uh, is the disconnect between the IT team that's building the data warehouse and the data analysts who are actually using the data. And, and that's, that's one of the things I would, I would recommend if, if you are looking at data engineering, looking at getting into this field, learn the business. Uh, it's, the data warehouse is a technical project because it uses a lot of technology to build it, but its purpose is not technical. Its purpose is business. People don't build a warehouse to have a warehouse. They don't build analytic systems to have analytic systems. They build these systems to answer questions. And the more you understand what those questions are and what the impact of the answers are, uh, the better you'll do at building what I call a better product. I, I refer to data warehouses as products. Hmm. Um, but typically the pain points people have that we're trying to overcome are, in addition to having tried and failed several times, legacy systems. Someone fairly new has moved into a company. They've got spreadsheets even um, mm -hmm. they've got sql server running on premise but nobody quite knows what it is how it works uh, they've got S ssis or stored procedures or other technical packages that are installed that no one quite understands and they don't want to touch it um, there comes a point where adding more changes introduces more more problems than it does benefits uh, and at that point, usually someone higher up decides that, hey, we need to invest some time and money in, in really redesigning and getting rid of all these layers and layers and layers of band-aids we've been building up. That's, that's probably a, a common common thing that people are trying to do is not, not invent something super fantastic and wonderful. Uh, some people are doing that, but probably 80% of the people I work with are just trying to get a, a workable system. Um, and, and the traditional way of waterfall approach of requirements and development and testing and delivery or production uh, typically don't work. Even agile methods are, are a little less, are a little better. But the, the big thing is uh, from a data engineering perspective, data architecture perspective, um, looking at things not as a technical solution, but as a business solution. There must be quite a bit of that sort of older architecture that, that's basically just been held together with chewing gum and string at the moment that's been going for years that companies you know we don't want to update it's going to cost a lot to update you know we don't know how to update while maintaining a, a sort of service level that that our clients expect there's got to be quite a few of them out there these days because it, it always feels like you're hearing stories of something falling over because somebody moved a string somewhere along the lines yeah, that's that's one of the things about software development in general. Software development is my background. Data engineering is sort of a, something I've I've walked into more recently. But there's a lot of similarities between the two. And having legacy systems where contractors came in and did development, or the people who built the system have have left a lot of personal knowledge stuck in people's heads. Um, all that just makes it more and more difficult. As I said, I've got a book here somewhere uh, that I got a long, long time ago when I first started my technical career. And it does say something I said a little earlier is at some point, um, fix, even fixing bugs in a program introduces more bugs than you are fixing because of this legacy system of all these components that no one, no one understands. It's probably gotten more complicated. That's probably one of the big changes in the last, say, 10 years 
is everything's become cloud-based and modular and um no one understands the whole big picture anymore when when i started i were, was working on pcs and machines and i could understand assembly language and i had a whole idea what the operating system was doing and i could really get wrap my head around what computer was doing well sometime 10 years ago 15 years ago technology uh left me behind <laughs> things some things like voice recognition i have no idea how that works mm -hmm. um Generative AI, I know what it can do, but I don't know how it works. The, the idea that you can give a description and it generates a picture uh, is amazing. So, so incorporating more technologies, cloud-based solutions, tools from different vendors, um, in some ways helps because it hides a lot of details. In another way, it hurts because now you've got configuration and maintenance and operations of multiple systems to keep your system up and running. And no one person is going to understand that. Are we looking at something in sort of 10, 15 years down the track where that happens again? Where, where you know, we've updated the systems, everything's new, we've, we've had the engineers in there building stuff. And then 10, 15 years down the track, because things are moving so fast in the industry, there's going to be that, that well, you know, we built this in the, in the, the late, early 2020s, we need to update it and we don't know how to do it. Is it going to be a repetitive cycle? Um... I think so. I think, you know, AI is the big buzzword. And yeah. and I'm proud to say that uh, every prediction I've made of AI in the last 18 months has been wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how good of a, 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 a fortune teller I am. But I'm kind of curious, then, what did you predict that was wrong? <laughs> well, I was, at a, I was at a conference once, and I was on a panel, and I was asked uh, the impact of AI on data warehousing. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I don't see a big impact because AI takes large amounts of data, requires large amounts of data. Uh, and pretty much data engineering is almost always one off cases. Um, I work with financial customers, uh, pharmaceutical, um, higher education. And a question they always ask is, hey, do you have something pre-built that we can use for finance or for higher education or for NGO, or whatever it is? And our answer is no, because we haven't seen enough commonality um between simple question what is a customer is hmm. a customer a person or is a customer an organization um how do you define net profit and net loss those those kinds of questions are what is first pers pii personally identifiable, identifiable information and what do you want to do with it what, what do you want to do with the social security number do you want to delete it do you want to drop it do you want to mask it um shunt it off to some other super super secret system there's enough variability that we don't have these unfortunately don't have these generic templates that people can start with. Uh, so I my answer to, at the time with AI was that there isn't enough information uh, to say, hey, how do I build a correct data warehouse for, for a bank? Um, that was uh, about 16 months ago when I said that. And I've, I've completely changed my mind on that because I didn't understand, uh, especially generative AI, I didn't understand how much training went into these things. So there's a, a specific architecture, data architecture called Data Vault, um, put up by a guy named Dan Lindstedt. It's been out for about 15 years or more. And it's got some benefits. Uh, it's got some uh, drawbacks. It's not for everybody. It can be a little more complicated and a little more time consuming up front. But uh, I was at the Worldwide Data Vault Consortium and apparently last year, they got a generative AI machine and said, okay, here's our source system. Here's what our source system looks like. Here's the rules of Data Vault. Build a Data Vault for this source system, and it got pretty far. I mean, I mean we're we're seeing things like people talk about code generation. A lot of what we do at Wearscape is template based. Um, whether it's how do you create a dimension, how do you create a fact, how do you you know what are what are surrogate keys, all all this technical mumbo jumbo stuff. Um, a lot of that's done through templates rather than hard coding rules. And we're starting to look at using AI to generate those templates. Um, it's, it's, I would say that kind of generative AI is at the point now where Wikipedia was when it came out. It's nice, but it's, you can't quite trust it yet. Um, in fact, some people still don't trust Wikipedia. I tend to, I tend to read it and believe it, but I think generative AI is the same. It's, it's probably correct. I use it for ideas, for presentations, uh, for comparisons. Um, I want a quick description of what are, I was talking about iceberg tables. I may go to ChatGPT and say, 
tell me what an iceberg table is and how it's used. Uh, and it generally comes up with good information. Of course, I'll verify it. Um, but I, I can see um, the what we do at Wearscape, like I said, is data warehouse automation. There's still some manual interface to it. I can see AI really taking off and and producing something new. So your question is way, way, way back when you asked, uh, if I build something today, is it going to be obsolete in 10 years? Probably, but you're going to need something anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I, th I think you can build it flexibly enough. Uh, the, the big word in my field is metadata, data about data. Mm -hmm. So I don't just write code. I don't just write code to create tables and create links between tables and things. Uh, instead, I capture all that as what I want to do. And then an automated tool like Wearscape or, or someone else uh, takes that metadata, those relationships, those hierarchies, and produces the end result. So uh, the nice thing about that is if a new technology comes along, uh, a new design, something like that, I can keep my metadata mm -hmm. and uh, all the rules I've built, soft rules I've built about how do I handle account numbers? How do I handle phone numbers? How do I handle birth dates? Things like that. Uh, and my new system will use that metadata to build out my data, and data analytics platform uh, with the new technology. So I think that's something different now than wasn't there 10 years ago. I think if you built something 10 years ago and rebuilt the day, you'd be building it from scratch. If you built something today, I think 10 years from now, a lot of it's going to be uh, reusable. See, I, I actually caught up with Dan towards the end of last year. Um, and I think he got a little bit, he, he was impressed with what AI could do with building data vault. But I don't know if he was really aware of sort of the revolution that was coming he's always been very conservative about what's going to mm -hmm. happen in the future of data vault um but i think he saw that and went well you know we've been doing this for years and this comes through and changes the process of it and that's why he changed uh wwdbc his data vault conference uh to have a focus on ai this year because he, mm -hmm. he, he can see that the change is coming um I'm kind of curious how tasks over the last five years have sort of changed from your perspective. What have you seen change as technologies evolved over the last sort of half a decade or so? So one major thing is the way that the way the data warehouse is used. Um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, computers were slower, smaller. There wasn't everything was on premise. Mm -hmm. um, just just moving data from one system to another could, could take a long time. The, the, just the data throughput. So uh, refreshes and loads in a, in a reporting system or a data warehouse could be once a week, could be overnight. Um, I worked with uh, the Texas Department of Health and Human Services and they had critical reports they needed to generate every morning. It took them eight, 10 hours overnight to get the data and then generate the reports, which were critical for, for the next, that next day's work. So now what we're seeing is some of our customers are running updates on their data warehouse every five minutes. We get questions about real-time data, um, and it's a good question. Someone said, "Hey, we've got a customer service group. Should they be should they be working with the uh, transactional systems, the real-time systems, when they talk with customers, or should they be working with the cleansed data, the corrected data that's in the data warehouse, which may be 10, 20 minutes old?" Uh, I can't answer that question without a lot more information. Being a professional consultant, my response would be, "It depends." Um, yes. Good response. It works everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And then every once in a while, someone will ask, depends on what. And then they have to say, well, you have to maintain a balance. Mm -hmm. that's, so that, that's, that's always the follow-up answer. Um, so I started using this term uh, operational data warehouses. I think that's something that's happening now that wasn't happening five years ago. Data warehouses are becoming not just analytic systems, but operational systems. Um, they are reporting data that's being used in real time. An example was we have a customer that um, does fractional jet ownership and they've got real time reports they have to have on pilots and air crews and airplanes for allocating crews and planes to the requests that come in. And there's very strict legal government requirements mm -hmm. on who can do it. They have to be certified. They can only have flown so many hours. They have to have so many rest days. So they're using their data warehouse for that kind of, of, of analysis. Um, I am seeing people using combining AI and doing predictive analysis. 
uh, predict uh, yeah, predictive analysis on say a warehouse, an actual physical warehouse where mm -hmm. you're supplying product. Uh, let's say you're manufacturing something and you need six different components to manufacture it. How much do you have to have on hand? That's a good basic question. You have too much on hand, you're wasting time, wasting money, wasting space. You have too little on hand, you, you can't produce enough of what you need to produce. So those kinds of questions feed into point of sale systems, they feed into purchasing systems, they feed into customers, they feed into vendors. You need data from all these different sources uh, that has to be amalgamated and then combined in a way that makes sense. And that's essentially what a data warehouse does. It combines disparate data from disparate systems and gives you one view of, as I said before, what is a customer? What is, how do you define net profit? How do you define what a, a unit of production is? Uh, what is a work order? Those, those, those kinds of things. Because system A, system B, system C maybe have entirely different views on what those things are. So someone, that's where the data engineers come in, have to decide uh, what is our conceptual, conceptual model of what it is we're building. And then how do we transfer data from our logical and physical systems into that conceptual model in a way that makes sense? So because computing power is better, because data is much more accessible, um, as I said, those things are starting to, in fact, impact the operations of a business, which takes data warehouses to, I mean, now you have to have high availability. You have to have data ops teams. I've heard the term DevOps used, monitoring systems, because if you're 10 years ago, your reporting system goes down. Well, great. You've got day old data for your 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 bar charts and things. Uh, but now you can shut down production lines. That's a lot of pressure. And you wouldn't want to screw that up too much. You'd have people sitting there calling you over all hours going, why have I not got what I need? Just, That's yeah. one of the reasons I liked uh, data warehousing was having been in production systems before. Mm -hmm. You do installs at three in the morning. Uh, you get support calls at three in the morning. Um, you get, you know, someone in New Zealand who's calling you at, during the day there and it's, they need an immediate answer. One of the nice things about analytic systems is I haven't had a pager. I've rarely had to work, uh, late at night. Uh, I think once I've been at Wearscape for almost five years, um, except for self-induced deadlines, I don't think I really had to work, uh, the wee hours of the morning or very many weekends. That sounds like a dream. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, I would definitely recommend this more than than uh, a production systems. Uh, if you're low stress, um, the the burnout rate is going to be much, much, much lower. That's that's good. We need to look after people better that way. Yeah, it's yeah, it's helpful to do that. Hey, um, what are some of the, sort of the the big bold projects that you've been impressed by? Without giving away um, anything commercially sensitive <laughs> sure sure so mostly i'm involved in people that are starting projects yeah um they're they're looking at updating they're looking mm -hmm. at overcoming some technical debt um maybe they've got a project uh, one customer had an sap system in the united states and an sap system in europe and they were both separate analytic systems separate reports and the uh, executive said we need to combine these two and create one single project Probably the, the biggest uh, strategy, biggest hint, biggest uh, advice I can give to someone who's getting into data engineering and getting into building projects like this. And I've heard, I've said this, I've heard a dozen other people who um, are industry experts say it, uh, start small. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of the antithesis of big, bold projects. Start with uh, one domain, an HR system or an accounting system or a cust CRM, the customer resource management system. Uh, the, the phrases I've heard are don't boil the ocean. Um, you know, how do you eat an mm -hmm. elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of phrases are used quite a bit. So as far as big, bold initiatives go, um, I'm in the early phases of the projects. So I see plans. Uh, mostly they are just large systems incorporating data from, from um, multiple different sources. Um, I, have, I haven't seen any real rocket science or moonshot or cancer curing kinds, kinds of projects. Um, but sometimes even just getting a, a working data warehouse up 
uh, in three to five months instead of a year and a half uh, is a huge thing. Probably the biggest, biggest, I guess the biggest one I've seen is there is a, it's on our website, so I can certainly mention the name as a white paper. Micron mm -hmm. um, was a Teradata customer and they just have massive amounts of data. They produce millions of chips per day in their fab plants and they capture thousands of pieces of data on every chip throughout the entire production process. Their data warehouse was five petabytes. Um, wow. They were adding a hundred billion rows a day. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to migrate from Teradata to Snowflake. That's no small task. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they picked the right tools. Um, as I said, it's on our website because we use it as a white paper. They um, got Snowflake involved. They made good plans. They brought in good consultants. Uh, they used us as a tool for automating a lot of the migration. Mm -hmm. And they finished that project, I think, in either 97 or 99 days. Wow. that's For, for that amount of data, that is impressive. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. That's really good. Um, but but as, as far as other other projects I've seen, uh, again, most of them are are I don't want to say boring, uh, but they're they're business oriented. Um, they're they're not. Yeah. We, I I saw a fun one. I saw a fun one. We have a customer that is a uh, professional baseball team in the United States, mm -hmm. and I got a quick peek at their their analytics system behind the background, and it's like there's a table that has data on every at bat every pitch, where every player is on the field, what angle the batter is holding the bat at, uh, how long the pitcher took to throw the, ball, throw the ball, not just for this team, but for every professional team and a bunch of college teams and a bunch of minor teams. So the oh, first wow. thing I thought was, that's just amazing having those kind of statistics. And then I thought, someone's got to capture all this data. Mm. There must be people out there in the fields with their – iPad or something, just capturing all this data as it goes on. That's uh, insane. We've got an, we've got another customer that's a, a, a basketball team, and uh, we're, for the f baseball team, we're on the sports side. For the mm -hmm. basketball team, we're on the business side. So uh, we do things like give them statistics on hot dogs per minute. How many hot dogs per minute are they selling? Mm -hmm. um, and they've got just some amazing technology there in that people are attending the game. They're, they're encouraged to use a, cer a certain app so we so they can, unfortunately, be tracked on where they are and what they're doing. But uh, they can use their data to say things like, hey, you know, if, if our team scores 10 points in the next five minutes, we'll give everyone $2 off concessions. Uh, so everyone starts cheering louder because they're looking forward to a, a cheap hot dog. And then it can so do things like... That's all data-driven. Yes, yes. And, and it can do things like, as they're leaving, say, hey, you're 100 feet away from a, a souvenir store. Uh, we won mm -hmm. tonight. Isn't that great? Why don't you go buy a jersey? Mm-hmm. So... That's impressive. A lot of the, the uh, exciting part, a lot of the interesting part, the fascinating part, doesn't come from the data warehouse itself. It comes from the analytics side who's doing it who's yeah. looking at the data and what they're doing with it that, that's yeah I, I i've never done that much stuff with sports teams yet I, I used to do a little bit of work with the all blacks many 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 years ago but that was more of a physical running up and down the field role which i couldn't do now in my 40s if i tried <laughs> um but yeah that just the amount of data that goes into something as simple as go buy a hot dog that's crazy stuff um how did you get into this into this field so my background, like I said, always been technical. Um, mm -hmm. I was always good with numbers, always good with math, good with logic. Uh, I did a lot of low-level programming, so I had that background. Um, in the late '90s, I got involved in a company that built warehousing, warehouse management systems, actual physical warehouses, forklifts, mm -hmm. pallets, those kinds of things, controlling everything within the, the four walls of the, of the warehouse. And that's when I started getting involved with um, SQL. Mm -hmm. Oracle and, and Informix. Um, so that was always kind of neat. Uh, the idea of relational databases was new to me. Um, like I said, I always like learning things. I did a stint of uh, quite a while as a professional consultant. 
doing, it's called application performance management. Basically, we're installing a bunch of monitors on a bunch of different technologies and um, correlating all that data to tell you that this web page is running slow because the SQL statement runs slow. Uh, that kind of correlation was, was, was you know, kind of magical. But that, that gave me insight into a lot of businesses and a lot of personalities. I, for 10 years, I was pretty much constantly on the road. And probably every two to three to four weeks, I was switching, switching customers. Mm -hmm. But it gave me a lot of insight into how do businesses work? How do IT, how does IT fit into a business and how does it work? And uh, after that, I started uh, working at Wearscape's parent company called Idera as a solutions architect, moved into the role of solutions architect at Wearscape. And because of my background, um, for about a year and a half, I was handling all the post-sale stuff, the training, customer success, customer support, uh, relationships with partners, things like that. Um, we had some turnover in our marketing department, so I became the product marketing manager. Um, one of the skills I'm told I have is that I can explain complex things in simple terms. And I, I really try to do that when I talk with someone is I, I, try, and I try to understand what their background is, what they're saying. Uh, and then as I'm talking to them, I'm looking for that, you know, head tilt and a little bit of confusion on their part. And I know, okay, okay, I need to step back a little bit and, and maybe explain it a little better. Um, so it, it's kind of a varied path. It, it, I heard a long, long, long time ago that when people first come out of college or university or get their first job, they come out as generalists because they don't have a lot of experience. Um, so they've got general knowledge of concepts and things. And over the next five to 10 years, they become specialists because they build up technical knowledge and skills like that. And then maybe five or 10 years later, they become generalists again um, because they move beyond a, a simple language, a single language or a technology or something. And they've got more a broader uh, scope of, of technical knowledge. So I'm back to being a generalist, someone who I guess is perfect. Knows a little, One knows a little bit about everything. Sure. <laughs> it's actually not, not uncommon with the people that I've spoken to as well. They do go through that cycle of, you know, just come out of study. I want to do everything. I know everything. And, and then realizing that the, the careers that they go for and the jobs that they go for sort of puts them in a position where they can learn a bit more about something specific. And that's how they build up that, that information base. And then they might go into another role where it's everything's much more open and much wider in what they have to achieve. So they have to go and be a bit more generalized in, in what their role is. It, it's kind of fascinating to sort of see that roller coaster happen over and over with a number of people's careers. Um, but as I said, the last question I've got for you is what advice would you give to somebody who's looking at a career in data today? Um, understand that, as I said before, no one knows it all. There's going to be a lot of gaps in your knowledge, so don't let that hold you back. Uh, a good good understanding of uh, SQL or SQL, whichever you want to call it. There's, I know there's a whole religious argument about that. Um, try and understand not just the technical side of it, but as I said, the business side. Um, you're, you're there and you're going to be hired and paid to work, not because of the company loves technology and loves technical people, uh, but because you're there to solve problems. And um, like like I did, just uh, just keep just keep learning. Um, I, I spend, like I said, about a quarter of my time reading up on new technologies. Um, Microsoft Fabric came out a year ago. And uh, all of a sudden, I had about three months to get up to speed on that so I could speak somewhat intelligently about it. Uh, luckily, no one else knew a lot about it, so they couldn't ask very in-depth questions. There's, there's some, mm -hmm. some other technologies where people ask some really in-depth questions, and I'm like, I don't, not, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. I mean, that, that's one thing. Uh, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. And then be sure and follow up. <laughs> uh, I learned a long, long time ago, there's nothing wrong with saying you don't know or you don't understand. That's perfect. That's, yeah, I, I've never liked working with managers who are like, no, no, I'm going to fake my way through something I don't know, because you, you screw up more often than you, you get away with it. Yeah, as I said, there's so much out there to know. Nobody knows it all. So yeah. I, I, someone may come to you with a very specific question about a certain technology, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll find out. I'll, I'll find someone who knows, or I'll do enough research, and I'll give you an answer, but I don't know. I've, I've never had a problem with that. I've never had anyone go, well, God, you must be stupid. I've, <laughs> I've never, never heard that. I think everyone else kind of implicitly understands that, that 
everyone has gaps in knowledge in, in some areas. Perfect. That's all my questions. I'm done okay. and dusted. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I'm Absolutely. hoping that you get away from all the big heat that's supposed to be hitting the States. I keep <laughs> hearing heat waves and horror stories and all the rest of it from what's going on over there at the moment. So, yeah. yeah, we Good had luck. an incredibly mild winter, so everyone was expecting a really hot summer. But as I said, in Dallas, it's been really, really mild this summer. Hmm. Relatively Hopefully speaking. Safe. Yeah. Temperature sure. in the mid-30s. Okay. Mid-30s sounds scary in centigrade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But normally it's a, normally it's closer to 40 or higher. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. I've, I've only been in 40 degree heat once and it's not something I would want to do again. It is not pleasant. Not at all. Um, Patrick, thank you very much. Real, real, real quick tip. Sure. One of the ways I, I convert from centigrade to Fahrenheit is in Fahrenheit, the body temperature is 98.6. Yes. It's the standard body temperature. That's exactly 38 degrees in Celsius. That is that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I will write that one down. Thank you very much, Patrick. It has been fantastic talking to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, thanks again for watching this episode of the Data Radio Show. And I want to thank Patrick again for sitting down and joining me. It was really cool to have a catch up with someone who is so full of energy and full of life and enthusiastic about what it is that he does. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe with this video. Tell everybody about what's going on out there. Or if you listen to this in a podcast, tell everybody to download the podcast. It's pretty easy. And don't forget, you can come and join us over on the school app. We have a classroom over there for the Data Innovators Exchange, where you can chat to other people who work within the data industry, as well as do some courses on different sorts of data management systems. It's all completely free, easy enough to go and join. I'll make sure that there's a link in the description below as well for that. Look, until next time, have yourself a fantastic week, and may the force be with you.